and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. And we will make America great again. Well, hello, friends. Pro-Life leader Frank Pavone here, National Director of Priests for Life. Welcome to Praying for America. We've got our whiteboard set up tonight because I want to talk about the presidential primaries, show you some statistics, talk about some of the things that Democrats are trying to uh, pull off with these primaries. And then I want to say something about, well, this no labels group and some of this stuff that's being said about, uh, well, you know, let's try to reach across the aisle. Let's try to come to more uh, of a bipartisan approach here. And, well, we're going to have some things to say about that as well. So important things tonight, lots of things you'll be able to share with others as we continue to move forward in this election season. And always looking at these things from the perspective of the Word of God. And therefore, we start with the Word. We're going to go to the book of Leviticus here and read a couple of paragraphs. Leviticus 19. Starting with verse 15, we read this. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we gather tonight today to pray for America. We gather each day to pray for this nation and for the world, for your people, for your church, we ask you, Lord God, that we would indeed have leaders who will judge justly, who will lead us in the paths of what is good and what is right. We ask you, Lord, that out of love for neighbor, we may vote wisely. Because in electing the proper leaders, we do good to our neighbors. In electing the wrong leaders, we do harm to our neighbors. And so, indeed, the basic commandment to love our neighbor requires us to exercise our voting responsibly, requires us to choose wisely, requires us to inform ourselves thoroughly, requires us to take into account not just our own needs as individuals, but the needs of our fellow citizens, the needs, indeed, of our children and grandchildren as we elect leaders who will shape the very direction of our country. Give us that wisdom, Lord, and give that motivation to our fellow citizens as they prepare to vote. The motivation, indeed, of loving our neighbors as ourselves. We ask this through the Lord and Judge of every nation, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so, friends, the 2024 presidential primaries. Let's look first of all at something that the Democrats are doing. If you remember in 2020, what happened in the uh, primaries, the first two primaries, uh, Biden um, didn't do too well. Iowa started it off followed by New Hampshire. And uh, Biden came in in Ohio and Iowa in fourth place. And then in New Hampshire, Biden came in in fifth place. What happened? Who, which state was next? South Carolina. And with the help of a certain uh, representative, uh, Clyburn, there, one of the deluded uh, Democrats uh, there in the House, Biden uh, pulled off uh, pretty well in South Carolina. Now, 
What they're doing this time, therefore, is trying to shift South Carolina to spot number one. Except New Hampshire has it by state law that they are number one in the primaries. And, of course, the Iowa caucuses uh, um, usually happen before that. So as far as what's going to happen on the Democrat side, things are a bit contentious right now and in flux. Back in December, the party, the Democrats' uh, Rules and Bylaws Committee, entertained a resolution regarding having the South Carolina primary on February the 3rd. And uh, again, North Carolina, uh, uh, New Hampshire is not uh, too happy about this, and they're insisting that they are going to be the first primary and that, uh, you know, if the Democrats want to uh, uh, be on the ballot, if they want to have Biden on the ballot, uh, they're going to have to go along with, uh, with this particular arrangement. So the, the committee said, well, okay, you have, you, New, New Hampshire, have until September 1st to um, get this all uh, sorted out. And uh, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. But it's important for us to see what it is that they're trying to do because 60% of the uh, South Carolina voters are African American. And of course, they have a big uh, sway uh, in the Democrat Party. Now, you, we have seen historic gains in the black community by President Trump, and I think that's only going to continue. Uh, as we go into this, uh, this new election season. So it's interesting to see, uh, and it will be interesting to see, how the Democrats try to uh, bank on the continued uh, support of, uh, of African Americans. Their, their support in the black community is, in fact, uh, beginning to be uh, pulled away from them, and rightly so. I mean, uh, this time around, well, we're going to see that, uh, I think that that will, uh, that will continue to happen even more. So I wanted to give you a little bit of an update about that uh, unresolved situation about the order of, the, um, uh, the, order of the, the primaries in terms of the Democrat Party. But when we look at, the, um, when we look at where things stand on the uh, Republican side of the race, I wanted to share with you a few statistics. Now, uh, the uh, NPR and PBS uh, NewsHour and, uh, and Marist did a poll that came out uh, just about a month ago. And uh, then I want to show you uh, a more recent one that came out just uh, a matter of, uh, of days ago. So one of the interesting questions is about, you know, when you, look, when you ask Republican voters, all right, are you looking to vote for somebody based on where they stand on principle or are you looking for somebody who you believe can beat Biden in the fall? Which of these things is more important to you? And interestingly, 63% of Republicans and Republican-leaning independents, 63%, say they are voting on principle. In other words, not that they don't want the candidate to win in uh, November. It's not that that's not important, but they would rather see somebody standing on conservative principles as the Republican nominee. That's the first consideration uh, that they have. That's the first thing that they want to see. And that's important. And that's uh, actually what we're going to see is we have the best of both worlds going on right now when it comes to the polling because uh, 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 well, we'll get to that in a moment to, to look at who's ahead of, uh, of Biden. But 63% do, do uh, and this is not surprising because the voters, especially when we're dealing with the kind of battles, the moral struggles, the, the, uh, the conflict between Republican and Democrat has become more and more simply a battle between good and evil, uh, it's not surprising that, uh, that this is showing up this way in, uh, in the polling. What about the favorability ratings of the various candidates? 
on the Republican side in the, uh, in the primary. So what we see right now, if you look again at Republicans and Republican-leaning uh, independents, President Trump's favorability continues to go up. If you look at Trump, in February versus uh, now at the end of June, let's say summer, it has risen. February it was 68%, uh, percent, and now it has gone up to 76 So those favorabilities continue to rise, uh, despite the negativity coming from the, uh, uh, we shouldn't say just negativity, but despite the weaponization of government coming from the Democrats who continue to try to indict him and, uh, and uh, so forth. The favorability of... Um, DeSantis is uh, nearly identical to what it was in uh, February, and that was around, uh, uh, around 67, 67%. This is favorability now. This is not uh, who uh, are you going to vote for. Tim Scott, Senator Scott, is the only other Republican hopeful whose favorability rating hits uh, 50%. And it's at 50%, but he's the only other one who actually hits 50%. As far as the others, uh, Mike Pence's has gone down from uh, 51 a few months ago to uh, 45. Nikki Haley's has kind of remained constant at 41. And uh, the, um, her negatives, though, have, uh, have doubled. And congratulations to... Chris Christie, for having the highest negative score, the highest unfavorables at 50%. So this deserves a little mention over here. Christie, 50% unfavorable. And we don't need to comment much more on that. It's not surprising when you look at the kinds of things he's been saying about the front runner. As far as uh, Asa Hutchinson, Doug Burgum, the North uh, Dakota governor, uh, they don't have uh, the uh, name recognition. Um, it's low, let's put it that way. Vivek is Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, although uh, lesser name recognition, of course, than uh, the other ones. His favorability ratings are better than... Um, than any of the ones, uh, uh, the lower tier candidates that I just mentioned. Certainly better than Christie, better than Hutchison, better than Burgum. He's been doing pretty well. And he's been, uh, as we will see in a moment from one of these later polls, uh, rising up in uh, the uh, polling. As far as on uh, the Democrat side, again, favorability impressions with Biden have remained unchanged uh, since February. The Democrats and the Democrat-leaning independents continue to have a favorable impression of Biden. Now, I don't know what they're looking at or what they're paying attention to. I think this speaks less of Biden himself than it does of the alternate universes, the alternate um, worlds in which we're living and in which we're hearing news. We, uh, we did a comment uh, the other day about how, um, I think it was Dick Morris who was commenting how you, uh, you look at uh, the electorate and they're basically divided between the people who are looking at uh, CNN and MSNBC for their news uh, versus those who watch, uh, on the other hand, and it's a little bit more, who watch either Newsmax or... Fox News, not that Fox has been uh, certainly not favorable to, uh, to Trump, but you get a little bit more of the kind of news of what's going on in the uh, uh, investigations against uh, uh, Biden, for example, and some of the other stuff that viewers of CNN and MSNBC are not hearing anything about. Uh, taking all that into account, it's not surprising that you still have this favorability uh, view of Biden among Democrats. Um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, is receiving uh, favorability ratings of uh, more like 35%, uh, uh, but then you've got a 
good 31 percent who are saying they're not sure or that or they haven't really heard about him so a lot of that is still um, yet to be seen how that will uh, pan out so all of this like I say is from the end of June if we look now at uh, more recent polling uh, taken from just a few days ago end of July what are we seeing in terms of how these candidates are playing out among the um, registered voters now this is uh, this is a, um, a Harris poll Harvard Harris poll President Trump continues to lead the field as all of you know by a good 40 points over um, DeSantis. Let me just put the numbers here that we see at the uh, end of July. So we have Trump at uh, 52 percent, DeSantis at 12 percent, so you see that 40 percent uh, gap. And then in third place, now we see Vivek Ramaswamy who uh, has garnered 10 percent and he has surpassed uh, Pence who's now in the fourth place with seven and then after that uh, uh, Nikki Haley with four and then uh, the other ones with uh, even less so interesting dynamics here in as much as Trump continues to dominate and Vivek goes up from uh, fourth to uh, third place if asked is the country, and this is one of the questions, of course, that we look at all the time, is the country on the right track or the wrong track? 61% of these registered voters continue to say it is on the wrong track, and that's where that particular measure falls right now. 61%. It's pretty high. And uh, it's been high for a while, and it's been high for a while for a reason, that the country, in fact, is very much on the wrong track under Democrat influence. And speaking of that, and, for one, of, and one of the big reasons that accounts for this uh, statistic is what many people would call the culture wars. More and more voters, and we've talked about this at length on this program, see the current political divide as simply a battle between good and evil. And brothers and sisters, there are those now who are coming along with this um, no labels approach. And you know, you hesitate when you, when you even talk about this because no labels is in fact a label. But they're calling themselves no labels, and this is a group of people who are trying to say, oh, you know, can't we just, instead of, can we somehow get beyond the Republican, Democrat, partisan divide? And they'll talk about things like, you know, reaching across uh, the aisle, um, working in a more bipartisan way, uh, working in a common ground approach. And I think that, uh, well, adding into this something that I hear in a lot of church circles, working in a, a, a mindset that says, well, the most important uh, virtue in politics is civility let's be civil towards one another and brothers and sisters I really have to register some objections to all of this here I don't have any common ground with the things that the Democrats are doing to America I don't have any common ground with the Biden policies I don't have any common ground with people who are trying to sexualize our children or kill them in the womb without any restrictions, limitations, or reservations whatsoever. Unlimited abortion, even in the latest months and weeks of pregnancy. There's no common ground here between life and death. I don't have common ground with those who are trying to 
destroy the border, weaken the military, defund the police, and not able to tell the difference between a peaceful protest and a violent riot. I don't have any common ground with people who are trying to weaponize, not just trying to, actually weaponizing government, and try to throw their political opponents in jail. And we're not just talking about President Trump himself, but we're talking about his uh, key aides, for example, who uh, uh, we can give several examples in our recent past where their cell phones have been confiscated uh, by the FBI or I was recently with Mark Houck, the pro-life activist whose home was raided by uh, the FBI with guns drawn and early in the morning on their front lawn with their, uh, lawn with their children right there at the door or the former president's home being raided at Mar-a-Lago People who at the same time are trying to just completely take over government, um, destroy the Supreme Court, destroy the Electoral College, because they don't want to have any possibility of losing elections through some kind of a fair and uh, equal process. But no, they want to take over completely the levers of government, the levers of elections, and re reform the entire system in such a way that only they have the advantage. We don't want to have, not only do we not have, we don't want to have any kind of common ground with critical race theory, with communism, with Marxism, uh, with people who trash our founders and have no respect for the Constitution. And yet we find those that are trying to say, let's be more reasonable and civil about this. Let's get rid of the toxicity here and all of the uh, outrage. Let's not be so angry and divisive in our politics and uh, let's try to have a more um, return to normalcy. And brothers and sisters, I have spoken about this before as have many others. If you want to get away from the drama, if you want a return to normalcy in politics, there is one path to doing that, and that is victory. Victory over the people who hate this country. Victory over the people who are trying to replace our constitutional republic with some kind of Marxism or tyranny. Complete victory over those who are trying to take the values that we have shared for a long time in a bipartisan way in this nation, that have in fact defined normalcy in our country, and are trying to obliterate them. You see, the problem that we, many of us have, with this call from the other side at this point in our history, at this particular moment in the political climate, to call at this point for just some kind of common ground and bipartisan civility is to ignore what's really going on. It's to miss the attacks that we are under. It's not even to recognize the nature of the battle at the current moment in time. They'll say, oh, I don't want to engage in uh, any kind of culture wars. Friends, we don't have a choice. The choice here is either that you engage in the war or that you lose. You lose your country, you lose your values, you lose your religious freedom, you lose the basic right to life, you lose the right to engage in free and fair elections. Said in other ways, as we have said it before, we are not just talking about ba the normal battles over policy differences anymore in our nation. We're talking about battles over the most fundamental assumptions and the most basic principles. So no, the answer is no. We have to rise up in what is a spiritual cultural war to preserve even the notion that there is such a thing 
as moral truth. Because that's what's under attack by the left. The whole idea that there is such a thing as truth is what is under attack by critical, critical theory, which gives rise to critical race theory and other kinds of theories that are infecting now and being imposed upon our educational system, our children, and all our fellow citizens. This is what we have to bring to prayer now, again, brothers and sisters, to renew our sense, our understanding of what the battle even is. Let's turn to the Lord and ask His grace at this moment uh, for that purpose. Lord, we, we, we come to You and uh, recalling Your words that we have to be able to interpret the signs of the times, that we have to be as wise as serpents, as we are innocent as doves, wise in as much as we recognize what the enemy is about, what the enemy is trying to accomplish, what the enemy is trying to take away from us. Lord God, enable your citizens to realize that we are at war over the very things that should constitute common ground, a love for liberty, an understanding of freedom, an embrace of virtue, that is what should constitute a common ground on which we then are free to have different policy ideas, but those policy ideas would be directed towards how to best secure freedom and how to best live the moral truth, not a battle over whether there is such a thing in the first place. Father, get us on the right track once again. As we have seen in these statistics, most of our fellow citizens do believe that we are on the wrong track, but help them to come to a deeper understanding of why and a deeper understanding of the fact that to get back on the right track, to get back to, quote, normal, there is no other way than victory in the current war, embracing the culture war, declaring sides, and obliterating the political influence and any other kind of influence of those who would erase our values. We stand firmly, O Lord God, on your word, which our founders understood as necessary for the success of self-governance. And we turn to you now with the same confidence they had as we say the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, friends, thank you very much. Take note of the various, uh, obviously more polling will be coming out and... Uh, uh, let's keep an eye on these trends and uh, at the same time recognizing uh, the role that we all have to play right now in registering voters, mobilizing uh, our own community, getting involved even at the precinct level. Uh, stay active, stay uh, sharp, and uh, let's continue to educate our fellow citizens on these important facts. Pre spread the word about uh, our program. Let's uh, continue to grow our online audience as we continue to uh, pray for America and to work to save America. God bless you for what you are doing, and we will talk to you very soon. Your probe into the Russia collusion hoax. President Trump has just been impeached on both Article The one only one. president of the United States to be impeached for a second the January time. 6th committee releasing its final 845-page report. Former President Donald Trump has been indicted. Remember this. Nothing worth doing ever, ever, ever came easy. Following your convictions means you must be willing to face criticism from those who lack the same courage to do what is right. Relish the opportunity to be an outsider. Embrace that label. Being an outsider is fine. Embrace the label because it's the outsiders who change the world and who make a real and lasting difference. The more that a broken system tells you that you're wrong, 
the more certain you should be that you must keep pushing ahead. This is a party that wants an outsider badly. I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. You must keep pushing forward. Never, ever give up. There'll be times in your life you'll want to quit, you'll want to go home. I can't do it. I can't do it. Just never quit. You will build a future where we have the courage to chase our dreams no matter what the cynics and the doubters have to say. You will have the confidence to speak the hopes in your hearts and to express the love that stirs your souls. And you will have the faith to replace a broken establishment with a government that serves and protects the people. But they're not coming after me, they're coming after you. I'm just standing in their way. And I always will stand in their way. I want to be a teacher. I want to be president of the United States. I want to find a cure for cancer. The choice to have an abortion alters the course of the future. Please remember, where there's life, there's hope. A message from Priests for Life. Priests for Life. Saving lives for over 30 years.